like I said, we're going to do things a little bit different. If you would, if you would bear with me, I want our ushers to come. We're going to receive communion before I preach. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. I want God to be able to have his way in every part of this service. That means when I preach and give an altar call, I'm believing God, even in this communion service, is going to bring healing to some people's lives. Somebody said, "How do you, well, I've seen it before. This is not unheard of. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you're here this morning and you're a visitor and you're a believer, we want to encourage you to participate. We do not believe in closed communion. I believe you've got to be a Christian if you observe communion. All right? Communion is a time when we reflect on our lives and make sure that we are doing the best that we can to live the way God would have us to live. Having said that, we're not looking for perfect folks. I need in the scripture this morning, I just want to read that famous story. And I read it out of so many different places. But I am just going to look in Matthew this morning. Over in chapter 26, verses 17 through 30, he said, Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Remember what we talked about Wednesday night. The disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to such a man and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dips his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. Now, I've, I've said this, I think, last month. I've got to say it again. That leapt off the page at me. He didn't answer their question. He said, he that dips his hand with me in the dish. All of them were doing that. All of them were doing that. Think about this, ladies and gentlemen. He had an opportunity to out the one that he knew was going to betray him. And he didn't do it. Oh, what a savior. Mm, 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 mm. He goes on, the Son of Man goes, that is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he said unto him, Thou hast said. And I've got to believe that was a whisper conversation. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, and this is my body. The scripture goes on and says, And he took the cup and he gave thanks. And gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it fresh with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And we all know what took place from there. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. The Lord started to deal with my heart about this way back when we started talking about revival. And I've tried uh, to go a different direction because I always, I want to do whatever the Lord would have us to do and what he would have me to preach. I've had preached revivals before. This is the first time I've ever preached one in my own church. Amen. In Jeremiah chapter number 18, look over there in verse number one, if you will. Notice what he said. The word 
which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter, so he made it again, another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand. Did you get it? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. What a tremendous message that God sent to the people of Israel. I want to talk to you this morning on the potter's work. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm not coming with anything probably that you have not heard before. Probably even things that I'll say I've said to you in the past. But I honestly believe that the old song is really true. And that is that Y'all remember the old song when we were kids, we used to sing in the booster band, I'm working on a building. Y'all remember that song? I'm working on a building. God is building a church. And the good news is, he said, the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Now, Sister Mary, I look around sometime and I say, God, how in the round world are you getting anything done with people like me? I'm just being honest. I'm not, I'm not trying to be uh, humble. I'm just telling you the truth. We human beings are a mess. Are, are y'all with me? Somebody said, well, speak for yourself, preacher. I will, and I'll talk for you too. <laughs> Amen. We're a mess. And uh, I know that, that, that he's God because if we were God, we'd have done give up on this situation a long time ago. But I'm encouraged when I read over there that I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now that tells me there's going to be a struggle. There's a war that's going on, if you will. And we know that we're living in the last of the last days and we would think that God is about ready to wrap up the work that he's doing in this world. And yet he's really just getting started. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Do you realize that when the church leaves this world, God is still going to be working in this world? How awesome is that? Trying and reaching out to those that are lost and undone. Now, I guess the number one thing that would characterize the people of Jeremiah's day is that they made light of spiritual things. It was not something that was important to them. I, uh, I was thinking about this this morning as I was reading over my notes, and I said, God, I said, Jeremiah's day is much like our day. And there's a lot of things that you could put alongside of what Jeremiah is dealing with in his ministry and look at it as to what we're dealing with in our ministry today. And the thing is that God knew it then as he knows it now. The people of Jeremiah's time were people, if you will, that were wrapped up in sin. They were habitually, they, had, they, they, they were a, in a habitual lifestyle, if you will, that was both offensive to God and also grievous to God. And uh, God began to deal with Jeremiah's heart. And they were scattered, they were saturated, if you will, with iniquity, and they lived in idolatry, worshiped all kinds of gods. Somebody said, well, that's not in our country. Oh, but I beg to differ. Amen. Now, Jeremiah was sent by God. He reproved them. He rebuked them. He was tenderhearted toward them. He wept tears because of their sinful condition. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. Jeremiah wept over the condition, the spiritual condition of 
his nation and of his people. I read his writings and I, I'm amazed at how that he, at how that he, uh, he equates his day. And I don't see where Jeremiah ever take a pointed finger and pointed at the people that he was ministering to and saying, God, they're a mess. They're sinners. They're wicked. They're this. They're that. No, no, no. Jeremiah was always in there with him. He said, God, we have sinned. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It was not, it was not, are, are y'all here now? We preachers have been talking already and it's amazing to me how that this ministry can't get along with that ministry and this, this group likes music this way and this, music likes, this, this group likes music another, another way and you can't fellowship over here because these folks are wrong because their music is not like yours. And somehow or another we forgot the spirit of Jeremiah where that we're all in this together. Would somebody say amen to that? Sister Carol, the enemy that we face is not the Baptist church across the road over here. Amen. It's not the Assemblies of God that's uptown. It's not the church of God that's across town. It's not, are y'all with me this morning? We have an enemy, but if we forget who he is, then we've already lost the battle. And there's such division in the body today. We may not, we will not agree on all points of doctrine. But can I tell you, that's okay? If we can agree at the foot of the cross that Jesus paid it all. Mm, can't add nothing to it. Can't take nothing away from it. He paid it all. Then we ought to be able to fellowship as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Now you need to understand that I'm not one of these ecumenical preachers that believe that you can throw a little Eastern religion in with Christianity and everybody just sing kumbaya around the campfire and everything's going to be all. That ain't what I'm about. I'm talking to the Christian church today that if Christ is your Savior and He's my Savior, that we celebrate the, with communion service the broken body and the shed blood of Christ, that we ought to be able to get along together. Amen. Amen. There's something wrong when we can. I'm just going to be honest with you. I read somewhere some time ago, and I don't know that I got this exactly right. I just pinned this in my notes a while ago, and it said, uh, it said that until we have wept for the lost, we don't really have a right to preach for them or preach to them. And I thought, my Lord, have mercy. That brought such conviction to my heart because, you see, the church is busy about ourselves in most cases today. But we've all got loved ones that are lost and undone without God or his son. And our job is to weep between the porch and the altar and let God to have his way in their hearts and in their lives. We sit around so many times justifying the reasons that we have things in our hearts that we know in our hearts shouldn't be there to start with. As believers, I'm talking about. You understand what I'm saying? So Jeremiah said, okay, God, you send me down there. And he said, I'm going to give you a word by going to the potter's house. Now, I've had God talk to me about every kind of place that there is. I'm going to just be honest with you. I, I mean, he's talked to me about driving down the road. He gave me a message. He spoke to me about all kinds of stuff. But I will never forget when I was sitting in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, at the potter's house out there on the, on the grounds, and the potter was working to work on the wheel, and he began to minister out of the Word of God as he worked on that, on that vessel. Man, I was blessed beyond, beyond my ability to describe to you because I could see in everything that he was saying and all that the scripture says as to what God was doing in Kenneth's life. He hadn't forgotten me. He had not given up on me. Amen. Are y'all with me this morning? Amen. That when I need a touch in my life, God is more than willing to give it to me. Are you with me? That I don't have to worry about a good, a true brother and sister condemning me because I avail myself of their prayers in our altar time. Mm, somebody don't shout me down now when I'm preaching so good at you. 
We'll sit there and carry that mess and carry that mess. Oh, I'll deal with it myself. I'll deal with it myself. And all the time, all the time, we're worried about what somebody's going to think about us and what somebody's going to say. I'm going to tell you something. The only person that we need to be worried about what they think and what they say is Jesus. Amen? He's the only one that paid for your sin. He's the only one that brought salvation into your life. He's the only one that has a right are y'all with me this morning to tell us where we ought to be? Now, I know that we ought to know this, but let me just tell you this. Uh, first of all, we recognize that God is the potter. Would you say amen to that? I'm glad you're not the potter. I'm glad I'm not the potter. Huh? Brother Williams, I've had the Holy Ghost speak to me before when I'd be all upset about the clay and that we're the clay. The vessel of clay is mankind. All right? I think we recognize that. And I'd be saying, oh, God, these folks you gave me to minister to, they're this, they're that, they're the other. And I hear the Holy Ghost say to me, they're mine. They're not yours. They're mine. Are, are y'all with me? Mm. Now, y'all ought to rejoice over that. Amen. Sister Pack says, we laugh all the time. Sister Pack says, every once in a while she says, she won't knock me in the head and tell God I died. Huh? <laughs> now, she never done that. As is evident. Amen? But what she's saying is that she gets frustrated with me. You ever get frustrated with your spouse? Don't answer out loud now. They're sitting right next to you. Are, are you? Huh? Uh, I say it's at times like that. She has to remember that I belong to the Lord. Amen. Huh? Now we know that the wheel is all the circumstances that influence our lives and that brings him or brings us to our best potential. God wants what's best for us. Man, I don't know if I'm getting this or not. I, just, just, just bear with me. There's four things that I want to share with you this morning. First of all, the potter's work is always constructive. Anybody can tear up, ladies and gentlemen. But God wants to build up. Somebody said to me one time, Pastor, how do I know if it's God speaking to me or not? I said, what is the voice saying? What is that you're hearing? And they began to talk to him, and everything was negative, and everything was what they're not going to do, and how ugly they are, and how, and I'm talking about spiritually, not physically. I'm talking, you understand what I'm saying? And, and they just kept on and on and on, and I, and I said, well, I said, uh, that's a good indication right there. And they said, already? You already know? I said, well, God already knows what you are. He don't have to tell you what you are. I said, God doesn't see you as what you are. God sees you as what you can be with his help. You see what I'm saying? So some of you need to understand that. Somebody coming to you all the time telling you how, how ugly you are and how bad you are. I just tell you, they're not used of God. When I was a young preacher, I used to spend a lot of time preaching to folks that wasn't there. You ever done that, brother? Man, I'd just rip them up one side and down the other. And one Sunday morning after church, I thought, God, I've done such a good job. Why didn't nobody respond to the altar call? And as plain as I'm talking to you now, he said, because you weren't talking to the ones that was there this morning. But see, God, ain't, he don't tell me how fair-haired, blue-eyed, good-looking I'm going to be. He always corrects me. You know why? Because he wants to build me. When he reproves us, it's not because he don't like us. He said, there's something in you that I can bring out if you just give me the opportunity to. <laughs> Amen. And I thought well, for a while, and I said, God, I don't understand what you mean. I didn't even talk to them folks this morning. I was preaching hard. I was sweating big. And I, Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And I heard the voice of God as he said, Son, you were upset because old so-and-so didn't show up to church. And such and such had something else to do. And such and such had somewhere else to be. And you were preaching at them when the folks that you should have been ministering to were sat in front of you. I can tell you it changed my life and changed my ministry. 
Because God was saying to me, son, I'm going to use the gifts that I put inside of you to build my folks that are there to hear what my word has to say. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. He's always constructive. He makes things that are useful. I love that. You ever, you ever just like to go to the potter's house? You ever been to a potter? Anybody ever been to a potter's house? We got one here in town. It's, it, Sister Becky used to do that. Sister Mary used to work there. Isn't it awesome, isn't it? I mean, I'm just looking at it. I'm amazed. Starts out with an ugly old piece of clay. And the next thing you know, they got vessels of beauty all around the, all around the shop. And I sit there and I watch and they throw that clay on their wheel and they begin to work it. And they begin to mash it down. I'm thinking, oh God, what's that going to be? That's just going to ugly up your hands. One of the things that that potter said up there at Eureka Springs, he said, out of all the vessels that you see around here, he said, which one of them do you think is the most useful to me? And the different ones in the congregation began to look. And, the, and they began, well, that one there is very nice. That's, that's a beautiful vessel right there. And different ones answered different questions. Well, I like that one over there. Or I like that one over there. I like that one back here on the back shelf. And the potter answered and he said, well, the one that's the most useful to me, all of those are nice. All of them have their purpose. But the one that's most useful to me is this one sitting right here by the wheel. And when he pointed at it, it was a little old common everyday bowl that was white, had clay all over it. The water that was in it was all muddy looking. Are y'all getting the picture of what I'm saying here? He said, I have to keep moisture in the clay. Somebody hear what I'm saying. So what I do is I reach over when I feel the clay getting a little dry. He said, I'll reach over and get some moisture in my hand and I go back and I apply it to the vessel that I'm trying to make. And I thought, oh God. Nobody chose that vessel. Nobody because of what it looked like. Uh, you say, Pastor, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to tell you that sometimes the people that we might look at and we might judge as being the ugliest, as being coming out of the worst sin, as living on the worst side of the tracks, as being the lowest of the low, are the very ones that the Holy Ghost is trying to use to bring productive individuals in our lives. Amen. How awesome is that? You've heard me tell the story before of people that knew me when I was growing up. And then whenever I preached a funeral in their presence, they come to me at the back of the hearse and they said, aren't you so-and-so? And I said, yes, sir, I am. And I recognized him from my kid, from my childhood. And he said, and you made a preacher? And I, and I said, hey, God got a sense of humor, don't he? Amen. Who would have ever thought that? I pastored people before that said, God can't do anything with me. I, I, I come from such a, I said, just give him five years. Just give him five years. Surrender yourself to him for five years. If God don't move in your life and change your life radically, you have my permission to walk out the church and never come back. She looked at me strange. How can you say that? I said, because I know God. I know what God is up to. My wife and I got married. Didn't nobody give us a chance. Didn't nobody give us a hope or a prayer. My in-laws said, y'all are just lusting after one another. Y'all don't love one another. Well, I knew I loved her as much as I knew what love was. Forty-seven, soon be 47 years later, I realized I really didn't love her then. I just, it, I was, you know. But I love her now. You understand what I'm saying? Those days that she wants to knock me in the head and tell God I died, that's just every once in a while. She wouldn't take nothing from me. Somebody say amen, Sister Pack. <laughs> See, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is whatever's going on in your life right now, whatever the pain is, whatever the hurt is, God is going to use that in a constructive way to produce in you what God wants you to have. And what God wants you to become. Because God always builds up. He's always building something. 
Are you, are you with me today? It doesn't take any brains to destroy something, does it? Uh, the second thing is today, and that is uh, that the work of God is planned. I know this is different. I tried to get away from this. I said, now God, I got a good Holy Ghost revival message over here that I've got to preach. But I'm telling you, this message right here can start revival in your heart. If you just take and somebody said to me one time, I said, man, you preach revival. You preach like a pastor. I said, that's what I am. I just want to preach what God gives me. I don't have five sermons in a briefcase when I go preach a revival. I just say, God, whatever you want, that's what I want to give to them people. Those folks belong to you. Hey, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And I said, now, God, you, you've got whatever it is that you've got. And, he, and he, said, I, he said, I want them to understand that they're part of my plan. Amen. God not only wants to build you, but God said you're part of my plan. Right. How, how awesome is that? You mean I'm a part of God's plan? Yes. You mean my family's a part of, of God? Yes. Are y'all with me? I mean, God is concerned about it. And so God said, I'm going to build you. But he said, I want you to know that I've got a plan for your life. Somebody shout a good amen to that. It means that God has a strategy, amen, uh, uh, or, or with difficulty that God may work his plan. The potter plans every vessel that he makes. Now get with me now, church. The potter doesn't trust uh, to luck. Are y'all hearing me? No, 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 no. Uh -uh, no, -uh. they're too important. I'm not just going. I'm not going to fly by the seat of my pants. I've got a plan for their life. Before they were ever born, I knew them. Before they were ever conceived in their mother's womb, I knew them. God tells us that. And so, what He's saying, you know, when things happen in our life, it doesn't happen. It, it, it doesn't work like we think it should. My granddaughters, you know, they, 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 they lose a boyfriend. The world's coming to an end. It's hard for me to relate to that because I got married so young. I was 17, such a pack was 15. I do not advise that. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? She turned 16 the next month. Two years later, we were parents. 15 months later, we, had, we were parents again. And no wonder we were sitting around, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But you know what I come to realize, ladies and gentlemen? God has a plan. God had a plan for us. Oh, somebody hear me today. You need, you need to give yourself a break and realize God has a plan for your life. Well, pastor, I'm old and I'm done. And I'm, no, 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 no. God still has a plan for your life. God still has something that he said, I want you to be able to do. In Psalms chapter 139, verse number 13, uh, 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 he said, For thou hast possessed my reign. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Psalms uh, 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 141 uh, or Psalms, uh, yeah, 14 and 1, he, 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 or he, and, and verse 13 of Psalm 139, he said, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and they and that my soul knoweth right well. Are, are you, uh, and, he, and he said, my substance was not hid from you. Before I was ever formed in my mother's womb, God, you already knew me. You ever spend any time in your life wondering why all the naysayers come along when you were a kid growing up, and no matter what you did, it was never good enough? And next thing you know, you begin to buy into the lie. I'm just going to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. If you tell your kids they're stupid long enough, they're going to believe it. You tell your kids they're worthless long enough and they're going to believe that. Mm, man, this. When I tell them that God has a plan for their life, then no matter where they are, they've got hope in that situation. Are y'all hearing me this morning, church? 
So the potter's at work in that situation. The potter has a plan in that situation. You mean even in, my, even in your situation, God has a plan. Oh, even what brings me tears, God has a plan. The devil would say, you're done, you're washed up, and there's no hope and there's no help. God has a plan. Somebody say amen. And then number three, and I'm trying to hurry. God's work is sometimes complicated. Now this is where I really want you to hear what I'm saying. We human beings are complicated sometimes, aren't we? Even to our own selves, sometimes we're complicated. In verse number four, he said, the, the vessel that he made was of clay was marred in the potter's hands, in the hand of the potter. So he made it again. Another vessel has seemed good unto the potter to make. Now get this idea. Now God is trying to build up. First of all, he's not trying to build something. Second of all, he has a divine plan. He saw this clay. He said, I want to make this out of this clay. This is what I want to make. This is a vessel that I'm going to make. Are y'all with me this morning? And then in the process of making that vessel, all right, in the contemporary English version, he said, and whenever the clay would not take the shape that he wanted, he would change his mind and form it into some other shape. Did, did you get that? Now, I want you to understand something. It was not what he wanted. Oh, God, help me, Jesus. It was not what he wanted. He had a plan, and the clay didn't cooperate. He's trying to build something, and the clay didn't cooperate. And so what he said, he said, I've got a plan, but because of this, this marred in my hand, he said, I'm going to take it, and he said, I'm going to make another vessel that seemed good in my sight. Now, now let me just tell you this. I, I've got to hurry with this because I'm going to give you a personal testimony right here. There was a time in my life and in our ministry that I felt like I was flying by myself. That God had forgot where we were, didn't know my name, didn't know my wife. It, it, was, it was just, it was a mess. I was a mess. And I took this church, and when I took the church, it was the best church I'd ever had. Nice parsons to live in. Comfortable. Constant salary. Somebody said, well, what's so special? Well, if you've been where I've been, you'd know what I'm talking about. And God put us in his place. I wasn't there six months, and I started having a fear. They voted us in for two years. At the end of two years, they're going to vote to keep us or let us go. Brother Doug, I wasn't there six months, and I started having this fear. They're going to vote you out. They're going to vote you out. Now, the church was fine. The church was growing. The church was doing good. We were having great services, people being saved, filled, healed, all of that stuff. People added to the church. And yet every time I tried, and of course, when it happened, I began to rebuke the devil. You lying scamp, you. God has blessed me, and you're just trying to take this away from me. And I'd push it back. A few days later, that, that fear would come back. Somebody hear me now. Somebody hear what I'm saying. And I said, I said, he's lying to us. And I dealt with that for two solid years. A few days before the election time came, a friend of mine and I had rode to Little Rock together on our way back. I was talking to him about how I felt and how I'd been feeling for two years. Election time's coming up in a few weeks, and this is what I told him. I said, I'm going to tell you something. I've had enough of this business. I said, if this church votes me out, I'm going to quit the ministry and I'm going to move to Little Rock and I'm going to get me a job and I'm going to go to work. That's what I told him, verbatim. He tried to encourage me. I, I'm talk, listen to me now, folks. I'm talking about sometimes we're complicated. I've got to believe God is talking to somebody right now.
Don't get tired of this church stuff. When that man let me out my driveway, he left. I wasn't in the house. It was a honey, 15 minutes. And an old preacher that had left my church, not because he was upset, but because he lived in another town and he couldn't drive there no more, he called me up and he said, Pastor, can I come talk to you? I said, well, sure. And I'm telling you, he had to fly from where he lived to where I lived because it was no time. He was knocking on the door. I opened the door and I saw a man who was on a mission. I said, come in. He said, well, can we go in the church? And we walked down the hall into the sanctuary, come through a door like that, come in and sit right over here on that front pew. And we were sitting there. And he said, I'm not going to mention no words with you, preacher. He said, I'm going to tell you, God told me to come talk to you. And this is what he proceeded to say. He said to me, he said, listen, he said, 1962, I believe it was, he said, I left this church, this same church right here. And he said, I made the statement, I'm tired of this. My wife and my kids wanted me to leave the ministry. And he said, I left this church in 1962 and I moved to Little Rock and got me a job. Brother Doug, I felt myself get weak in the knees. That's how you feel when you know God has got your number. And he said to me, he said, preacher, listen to me. Whatever you give God up for, you're going to lose it anyway. My wife left me anyway. My son grew up, don't want to have nothing to do with me anyway. I lost. You give God up for anything. And you're going to lose. Y'all hear me now? Somebody said, man, this ain't much of a revival. I feel, I know, I feel what you feel. I preach enough revivals. I know how I ought to be preaching. But I'm just telling you what God is saying. I don't know what's going on in your life. It doesn't make any difference with me what's going on in your life. I just don't want to see people hurt. And I sure don't want to see people give up. That old man looked at me and he said, I'm going to tell you something, son. Now, I was a lot younger then, so bear with me. He said, I know preachers that cut their right arm off to be able to preach like you preach. He said, that ain't got nothing to do with Kenneth Pack. That's God. Did you hear what I'm saying? A lot of times what we take credit for ain't got nothing to do with us. It's God in us. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so the Lord is saying to me, he said, Kenneth, he said, you just got to keep going in order for me to finish the vessel that I've got started. That old man said to me, he said, he said Pastor, he said, I'm going to tell you. He said, I don't know what's going on. He said, but if this church votes you out, there'll be another one votes you in. That ain't got nothing to do with the will of God for your life. Somebody hear the pastor. Somebody said, well, I ain't a preacher. I don't care. I'm talking to you where you live, whatever it is. And he said to me, he said, just trust the will of God. Let every decision be made to propagate who God has called you to be. And I sat there and I listened to him, tears running down my face because he don't know what I just said. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God. And then I began to think, Sister Sandra, how special I had to have been in the eyes of God that he would send somebody to me to correct me and, the ve and use my own words to correct me. Are y'all seeing what I'm saying? He says, son, you're mine and you're on my wheel. These circumstances of life, that is the wheel that God uses to make us what we are to become in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that old man looked at me with tears in his eyes. He said, pastor, he said, in this church I laid hands on the epileptic and God healed them. Miracles take place. But he said, when I left, he said, within six months, I had a heart attack and two strokes. 
He said, I went to the top of the company that I went to work for. I was flying all around the house, all around the nation. He said, I had, listen to me in church, church. He said, I had a brand new house in a brand new subdivision with two brand new vehicles sitting in the garage. I was living the high life. And in my mind, I never thought about leaving God. It was not a part of my life. It was not something that I wanted. It was not even something that entered into my mind. But he said, I somehow slipped away from what God wanted. And then he began to weep. And he said to me, I remember well the day. And he quoted this scripture that God put that clay back on his wheel and made another vessel that seemed good in his sight. Sister Mary, he said, I taught Sunday school in the same church in North Little Rock for 20 years. You don't see that very often. But he said, for 20 years, he said, I helped my pastor. I'd do anything that I could do to help his load to be lighter. If he had to be gone, I could fill in. But he said, physically, I could not take the pressure of pastoring again. And he said, I go to sleep at night. And he said, I dream dreams of crowds of people with faces that I don't recognize. And I wake up and I think about it all, all the time during the day. And I'm going to tell you what he told me. And I'm telling you not because of me, but I'm telling you because of you. Whatever it is that God is trying to do in your life, purpose in your heart that you want to allow him to do that. He will allow the wheel of life to spin. And in that spin, there's going to be tears of joy and shouts of laughter. There's going to be churches that come and go, pastors that come and go, friends that come and go. Things are going to happen that all of them is not going to make you feel like you want to feel. But thanks be unto God, he's got you in the palm of his hand and never give up what God is doing in your life. And the last thing, and I'm closing. The potter's work is agreeable. Did you get that? Say, so what are you talking about, Pastor? Sister Becky, would you come? God can only do in your life with what you give him to work with. Are you understanding? The clay has to be agreeable in the hands of the potter. In the hands of the master, a beautiful, wonderful, useful vessel. sermon after sermon, song after song, testimony after testimony about forgiveness and about moving forward and about letting the past go and you continually hold on to it because you feel like you've got a right and yet you stagnate my work and my will in your life so I can only do with what you've given me to do Just tell you this morning, every one of us.
us about skeletons in our closet. Every one of us got painful things that's happened in our life. And I hear the Holy Ghost saying yes, and I want to use that to make you what you need to become. And the only way I can do it is if you give it to me. If you don't give it to him, he can't work with it. When you give it to him, you don't have a right to go back and pick it up. You've got to forgive. Sometimes you've got to forgive those and they don't even ask you to be forgiven. It ain't about them, ladies and gentlemen. It's about you. Whoever you're not willing to forgive, they have control over you whether you admit it or not. Oh, I'm plowing deep here this morning. And i got to believe the Holy Ghost is too. You to bow your heads all over this building. I know I'm just a few minutes late. I figured I wouldn't be on this opening service. I've worked hard, Brother Kenny, not to be long. I will be eternally grateful for God sending my old preacher friend my door to stop me from making a big mistake in my life. Sister Pack and I had some friends, pastors. They'd been through some tough times. His wife had come to the end of the road. She was getting ready after camp meeting. She said, I'm going to move back to Oregon where my family's at and I'm going to leave my husband I don't want to be a pastor's wife anymore she went down to Baton Rouge went into the Church of God state camp meeting Dr. T.L. Lowry was preaching camp meeting that year and all of a sudden that man of God stopped panned that congregation pointed at them so there's a woman in this church right now that is making plans and making a decision that's going to cause great destruction. In Jesus' name, turn around. With tears in her eyes, she said, Pastor Pack, that was me. lived out her life as a pastor's wife. She said in the moment that that man of God said that, she said, I saw in my mind a picture of my husband laid in the middle of the floor, just a big pile of flesh, broken and weeping. And I knew that if I did what I'd planned to do, that was just the beginning of my sorrows. I'm going to ask you this this morning. If the Holy Ghost has come by you where you are, you know what's going on in your life, you know what you need prayer for, you know what your season is that you're living in, I don't know. But if you're willing to say, Pastor, I want to be clay in the potter's hands. I want to give him my life. I'm going to have to rededicate some things, but I'm willing to do that today. I'm going to let, I'm going to let go of some things. I'm going to invite you, no hands raised. I'm going to invite you to get up from where you're seated right now. Find a place in this altar to pray and give that situation to God. Revival starts with obedience. And we cannot have revival without obedience. Is God talking to you today? Father God, in Jesus' name, I ask the Holy Ghost to sweep across this congregation right now. Every person under the sound of my voice, God, I pray. Now, God, for three weeks, at least three weeks, you've been dealing with me about this. I'd circle this thought, I'd circle this message over and over and over again, and yet here, 
I come back to it full circle. I have to believe, Lord, that this was surface. Somebody is going to be here in this opening service. God, I'm asking you right now in the name that is above every name, please do what only you're capable of doing.